we'll have a, a brief case study. Um, some, uh, and then look at the other applic applications for, uh, for LIDAR um, as a tool, and then the conclusions at the end. Right, so LIDAR stands for light detecting and ranging. So in essence, it's a, a method of measuring uh, distance uh, using light. And there are a variety of different uh, um, LIDAR systems available. Uh, we'll go through that in a bit more detail. But more than anything, um, similarly to radar, um, it puts out an electromagnetic pulse, which is then uh, reflected. It comes back, uh, it's picked up by a sensor, and um, a measurement is taken from that. So if we take a, a look at them, and these are not all geotechnical monitoring methods. Um, there are a variety of different monitoring methods that are available. Um, there's vibration, there's optical uh, surveys, there's sound, uh, slope monitoring using LIDAR or radar, water uh, levels in physometers, cameras, and then satellite with INSAR and um, other methods. These are all available to the geotechnical engineer at the moment. So why uh, single out LIDAR as a specific uh, tool? Well, the, at the moment with the geotechnical engineers or practitioners is that you're getting large volumes of information being fed to you. Um, you need a way to be able to confirm or record issues. You need to gather data and interpret information in a safe way that uh, allows you to, um, to make good decisions. And one of the things I'm going to touch on today is that in the industry currently, there's an either or mentality. So in other words, people get uh, sort of comfortable with a specific type of technology, and then it's almost like that is the only type of technology that they're prepared to, to look at. But it's very important that as a geotechnical uh, uh, practitioner that you're able to use all the tools available to um, or at your disposal. And why is that? Recently, uh, there's been a number of large disasters, uh, both in Brazil and in, um, in South Africa. Um, and lots of monitoring doesn't mean that you're always off the hook. And what that means is that you can do lots of monitoring, but unless you actually uh, understanding that or, or getting a clear picture out of that monitoring, it, it's, it's almost as bad as not doing any monitoring at all. And what I want to look at is, is how to make the practitioner's job proactive rather than reactive. Because at the end of the day, as, the, as we say in English, your bum's on the line. Ultimately, at the end of the day, you are responsible. You carry the responsibility. Uh, and if something goes wrong, the people are going to come back to you and ask the question as to why uh, something went wrong. And in the industry, um, as, a, as an earth science practitioner, um, whether you're a geologist or a geotechnical engineer, um, you are allowed to be wrong, but you're not allowed to be negligent and you're not allowed to be fraudulent. So it's very important that you're able to show that you followed a sound scientific process in your... So why LIDAR? Well, it adds resolution to the picture that you're busy getting. And I'll explain that in more detail as we go along. Currently, there are 50, between 50 and 100 sites globally using LIDAR for active monitoring. Um, so this technology, although it's new to the industry and has only really been sort of actively pursued since about 2014, is gaining ground and it's showing that this is no longer just a gimmicky or a, a, um, a sort of a, an academic technology. This is something that's now moving into mainstream uh, uh, technology. So there are four pillars that we look at um, with LIDAR that we can add value with. First of all is active or continuous monitoring. Secondly, itinerant monitoring and change detection. So itinerant means uh, from place to place or moving around and change detection. And I'll get into that in more detail. Design conformance, which is very important from a geotechnical engineering point of view. And then also being able to gain a geological understanding uh, through mapping, etc. Now, bear in mind that many of the places that geotechnical 
uh, people work are changing environments. If you're in an open pit or underground every single day uh, with production, um, and again, even if you're working on a, on a tunnel um, in the Alps, whatever, it changes every single day because there's a production schedule that needs to be met and what you saw yesterday is going to be different to today. Um, I'll, the mining operation that I worked on, we had a saying that 24 hours at Lily Mine was a very long time and that was very simply because within 24 hours uh, things had changed so dramatically that we needed to, to relook at stuff. Right, so as you can see, um, roughly from about 2000, so it's nearly 20 years, MapTech's been involved um, with lasers, producing laser scanners. Uh, we're one of, uh, I think, two uh, long range laser scanning producers in the world. Um, and we've been doing this successfully. I'm not gonna get into too much detail about that, but as you can see over time, the scanners have got smaller, more, uh, uh, more compact, uh, and, and a lot more easy to use. Um, right, so scanners. So we do a basic overview of the types of scanners and that's quite important because if you go onto a website and you go onto Google and you Google LiDAR scanners, you're gonna get all sorts of results that come up. And as you can see, there's a variety of different shapes, sizes um, of scanners that are available to you. First of all, we have what we call structured light scanners, and these are getting cheaper and more accessible. Um, they basically uh, produce, uh, they have a camera and a light source, and that light source produces either crosshairs or uh, a grid over a surface, um, and an algorithm then uses that to triangulate that and then produces a very detailed picture uh, in the point cloud. So that's the, the first kind, structure light principle. And the applications for these would be doing things like scanning uh, vehicles, um, boats, airplanes for, for production. So if you've got maybe one of a, uh, uh, for example, one of a kind, you could then scan it and reproduce it using 3D printing. And it's also used academically for in archeology span um, and other sources. And then again, also looking at potentially um, crime scene investigations, damage to vehicles, etc. Secondly, there's a phase scanner. So phase scanners work different. They set out a pulse and the pulse then hits um, an item, uh, is then returned and there's a change in the phase, um, um, your phase measurement. And that is then measured and it then uses an algorithm to then get a distance from that. So, um, prime example of these types of scanners would be using them for forensic investigations and very detailed scanning. So face scanners are exceptionally high detail, uh, but um, obviously there's a limit to the range that they can scan at. So I'm gonna step out before we get into the last uh, sort of type of scanner, time of flight, and we just look at a traditional survey method. So if we take a traditional surveyor, you're going to have a, a, a theodolite or a total station and they're gonna have a known point in space. They're gonna have a known height. Uh, and then you're gonna to have to have another person out there that's also gonna have a staff with a prism on it. And they also that staff's gonna be set to a known height and they're then going to take a measurement. And they're gonna do that by firing a laser at the prism. It's then gonna be reflected and they're gonna get a time direction and angle from that and that will then give them uh, the distance. So the last type of LiDAR scanners that are available are what we call time of flight. So these scanners um, fire off loads of, um, of laser points and they then go off, hit the target, come back again um, and are reflected and picked up by a receiver and then that is then used to produce um, a point cloud. Two things to take into note here. Um, they can take uh, obviously survey over a long distance, but there is a change in pulse. So the intensity, et cetera, can be uh, derived from this. But as the laser leaves uh, the emitting source, so the scanner, 
it actually diverges. So the further away you get, the wider that laser point becomes. And that's very important to bear in mind. But where the benefit comes out of that is, is that very often because of the phase change, you can have, look at uh, first an intermittent or a last return of the point, and that can be then used for filtering out things like vegetation, dust, uh, uh, moisture, etc. So these are the type of scanners that are generally used for uh, slope stability monitoring because they have the longest range. So ultimately, which type of LiDAR do you use? And bear in mind that in the modern day and age uh, with an iPhone now, you can do um, structured light very simply and very cheaply for a couple of dollars. First of all, what type of level of accuracy is required? How much detail? Are there any access limitations? What is the distance that's required? Um, and the end results and deliverables that are coming out. So depending on the type of job you're doing, that's the type of scanner. So ultimately at the end of the day, not all LiDAR is equal. And it's, it's exactly the same for, for radar. The same type of radar is not used in a fighter plane that's used for uh, monitoring a, a, an open pit. Right, so within the, the LiDAR uh, sort of sphere, there are two different types um, of ways of setting this up. One is a, is a hub-based system. So as you can see there, we've got a scanner on the right-hand side that's set up on a survey bollard and there's a power supply source through the solar panels and the computing is done through uh, the Pelican cases. And those are very simply connected up through network cables, etc. And then the scanner will run 24 hours a day, um, seven days a week, and collect data continuously. So as, as you're busy ticking along the scanners, we'll finish a scan and then reset and start taking another scan. Um, what's also important to bear in mind is that um, things like weather, etc., are also monitored during the time because this has an, an implication on your uh, on your on your stability, for example, rain, etc. But it also has a bearing on how quickly um, or slowly light travels. So light or any type of uh, infrared radiation is going to vary depending on the, the density. And so weather station is included in that. Uh, that obviously is not necessary if you're going to be doing active monitoring in an underground setting because it's a very stable environment. The other option is going with a drive-based system, which is very similar to, to what you see in the, in the radar environment. So same type of setup, you've got a trailer and that's got everything built in, solar panels, generator, um, all your networking and computers. There's a weather station all built in and, and then it just has a, a, a mount, a, you know, survey bollard that's then lowered down. And depending on your type of environment that you're working in, this can, be then set up as you need. And I think that's where one of the benefits that we'll talk about a little bit later is, is that it's flexibility. Because LIDAR is based around a scanner, it makes it very, very easy and flexible to get it into different uh, sort of scenarios. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at uh, a bit of a case study um, and that is the CAMAN2 mine. So we started as a company doing trials with active monitoring in about 2014. And the idea really was to try and see if this was a viable technology uh, to do active monitoring. Um, so um, in this case, at CAMN2 Mine, which is a copper mine, um, we set up a laser scanner um, over a ramp area. Um, and in December 2014, the system successfully provided critical alarming for a block toppling event that took place. Um, and they were then able to clear the, the area and uh, allow the failure to take place and continue with normal operations. So the CAMAN2 mine is based um, just outside of Adelaide. Uh, it's a copper mine. You can see a, a slightly more uh, mine scale 
um, size there. And then you'll see that you've got three pits as well as tailings facilities around uh, the mine site. So that's quite important because I'll get into that in a little bit more detail later on. So just looking at the pit environment, um, there were three pits. You had the giant pit, um, the, the Nugent pit, which is um, where the failure took place, and then the Emily Star pit. And in that case, there were three areas where scanners were set up to do scanning over those areas. And that just gives you a bit of an idea of the range of the scanners. Right, so in the Nugent pit, um, you have um, basically fluvial deposits. There's a biotite schist, and then there's also andalute, um, andalusite biotite schists. Um, so being schistose material, it's very friable um, and very uh, susceptible to collapse. Um, and again, because it's being schistose, it's obviously foliates um, very easily and that, that causes some um, issues. So if we take a look at what alarmed the geotechnical engineers in the beginning is that they, they had a bit of slumping, a toppling event up in the top left-hand side of that image. Um, there were continually rock falls down onto the whole road. Um, there were or there was a flexural toppling event um, on the contact between the biotite schist and the andalusite biotite schist, as well as um, slumping uh, or the toe pushing out at underneath the whole road area. So that area there um, as a whole had a number of geotechnical um, uh, concerns. Right, so in the pit, there were three uh, geotechnical domains that were um, outlined. Um, there was massive garnet and elucid biotite schist, which is GDM1. You also had an upper highly weathered clay profile, GDM4, uh, which is basically overlying. And then highly foliated ductite uh, biotite schist, which came in at a low angle beneath. And they each had their own specific uh, geotechnical um, uh, sort of problems that were required, um, that required um, observation. In addition to that, um, as mining commenced, um, and you'll see from the enlarged picture, we start to see foliation occurring in the material. So as the area is being mined out, slowly but surely, uh, the pressure being released by the mining process, you start to get a change in the actual uh, RQD across um, a bench. And as you can see in that picture, um, in the bottom right hand side there, you can actually see tension uh, gaps starting to open up in the foliations in the material, in the sediments, which makes, um, it, it's a very difficult thing. And I've actually dealt with that uh, from an industry perspective in that uh, mining in, uh, uh, sort of a gray wacky uh, type material um, in the draw points uh, and an underground mining operation, we continually had to go down and monitor the draw points because over a period of weeks and months, the RQD would change as the stress has changed and uh, relaxed because of the material being extracted. So that RQD got uh, uh, less and less and the quality um, and the safety factor um, Got, uh, got less and less, and that, that made it very difficult. So there's continual change happening there, which is important to take note. So map tech century, um, the reason why it, it in this case was uh, chosen was because it's cost effective. Um, it was easy to set up. It only took about 15 minutes. Um, I've set up a number in my time, and it doesn't take long to get monitoring and going. Um, the scanners are IP65, which means that they can be left out in the in the open, and um, they basically can handle most uh, extreme conditions. Um, and this will constantly monitor uh, with continuous scanning until um, yeah, and feed that information back to the geotechnical team. So initially. Um, if you take a look at the, the high wall that was being monitored, you can see that in the zone one area over there, uh, there was uh, information being fed back to geotechnical engineers that there had been movement uh, detected. So they then started investigating and using the LIDAR as a tool in order to do that. 
So initially it was picked up with prisms um, and a berm was left at the bottom to stabilize it, but there was continual movement happening and there was suspicion that there was going to be a, an imminent failure. And obviously, as you can see from in the bottom left-hand corner there, you've got a switchback where trucking uh, and material will be being extracted from the mine. So this posed uh, a threat to um, people um, that were working on site and you didn't want to have a collapse happening while people were busy working. Now collapses are something that happen in a mining environment all the time. It's not, um, I'm going to say this, it's not a bad thing, it happens, but they need to be predicted and managed and allowed to happen and then they can then um, continue. And there's a, there's a number of large operations globally that have done that very successfully lately. So initially, um, using uh, the, the LiDAR scanner, they were able to detect um, movement and looking at both zone one and zone two, you started to see that there was movement taking place over a period um, of, a of nearly four months. So as time went by, they realized that, that something was, was happening and that movement was speeding up. Also using the LiDAR scanner, uh, the um, team were able to um, pick up or isolate the fact that there was actual flexural um, uh, gaseous busy starting to open up and that showed um, that there was uh, movement taking place. So rather than going up there with uh, potentially sort of bits of glass and sticking them down on the rocks and waiting to see if they crack or spray painting, um, spray painting and putting your team at risk, you're then able to take scans at a distance and come back and analyze them in the office in a safe environment and still get the same information out. Right, so initially uh, the continuous LiDAR scanner was set up perpendicular to the area of concern and as you can see from a scale point of view there's a, there's a bulldozer down the bottom there. Um, so every single time the scanner takes a scan, it also takes what we call a scene. So it takes a high resolution picture um, and that's very useful uh, because what it does is it then gives the you the opportunity to go back and flip through those scenes and actually look and see um, what's happening at the time. So if you get you know a failure alarm and you go and have a look, you can see okay the bulldozers pushed some spoil over a, a dump, you can then so, okay, well, that was caused by uh, production at the time, not necessarily a failure. And as you can see at the moment, there's some movement taking place in the graph at the bottom over here, but uh, nothing to, con to concern anybody at the moment. So production could continue. As we progress and the scanning continues, um, they're busy extracting from the bottom there, so you can see the blue, that's material being taken away. But you can see that the material is starting to move towards the actual scanner, which is the red, so there's a hot zone. Um, they've now broken that down into three bands. So the way that LiDAR uh, active monitoring works is that it collects data, you can then put a zone around that data, um, and it extracts the information from that zone. But it doesn't discard or stop monitoring around it. It just extracts the information that you need to look at at the time. You can then go and edit or change that zone depending on, uh, and it will then re, uh, you know, recollect all the data from the new zone that you've set up and redisplay that as a graph. So at the time, there's movement happening and you can see there's gaps happening here. So the scanner is being used for other things at the same time. So the scanner has been taken off, moved away and then brought back and they're checking this stuff continue. And as you can see from the displacement that's busy taking place here, this is a sort of moving up in, a, in an upward trend there and definitely some uh, serious warning signals coming through. As we can see over time, um, so that was the 24th. By the 27th of November, we're starting to get a much deeper curve happening. So it's three days later. And you can see from the, the image in the scene there that the area of concern is starting to really hot up and get red. Um, so it's moving towards um, 
uh, the scanner at a much faster rate. Um, and the, the people um, that have set this up have also set up zones in the background just to monitor other areas to make sure that there's, that there's no issues taking place elsewhere. Um, while they're focusing on this on this uh, impending failure. Okay, then we see um, again over time as it smooths out that it's um, things start to stabilize a little bit, but then it starts to um, hot up quite significantly, and you start to see that classic uh, failure trend in the graph from the displacement, and you start to get that. Um, acceleration that's taking place. So automatically it starts to climb up and that, that then, so the geotechnical engineers were then able to uh, start advising and start looking at predicting the failure. Uh, by the 29th, we see that it's getting uh, quite, uh, those graphs are getting quite steep. And late on the 29th, it eventually fails. And as you can see, the graph has accelerated, it's gone right up and then everything's stabilized again and you've got your displacement is, is, is a flat line. What's also important to take note and how they were able to predict this was that using this, you've got displacement, you also have velocity and you also have from that, you're able to determine the inverse velocity. So as your inverse velocity starts to move down uh, millimeters per day and starts to get towards zero, you can then use that as a prediction, a predicting tool in order to give you, um, and it was able to predict the failure within 12 hours and that allowed the mining team to then get everybody out of the area into a safe environment, allow the failure to take place and then um, uh, once the failure taken place, clean up afterwards and then commence with mining operations. So just to go back and have a look at that, you can see that there's a massive acceleration that's happening of almost two millimeters per hour over over the period. So that, that's quite important um, to be able to analyze that information. Just looking at uh, pictures there, you can see it was a flexural toppling mechanism that took place. So they were able to use the, the tools um, in order to predict what type of failure is going to take place. And that's that's quite important because it goes back to my comment about adding resolution. What type of failure are you intending on happening? Um, and you can look at a variety of different hotspots on an active monitoring system and, and have Diff the same type of uh, or different type of failures giving a similar type of picture. It's a question of being able to take that information and being able to take it back and actually get the right type of mechanism out so that you can predict what type of failure is going to take place and how that's going to potentially affect um, the area. And as you can see, a fairly significant failure because I mean, there's a little, there's a land cruiser down the bottom there for scale. It, it, it was a fairly, um, significant amount of material that moved. So how are they able to predict that using LIDAR? Well, as a byproduct of the active monitoring, you're getting a point cloud every, say for example, every two minutes as the scans are taking place. And out of that, you're then able to generate a surface and generate sections, which you can see in the image on the left-hand side. And those sections can be compared with uh, day by day. So you can create, take a, a scan, for example, at eight o'clock every morning, take it out of the, the file registry, go and create a surface from it, uh, generate uh, sections at the same places along that, um, along that surface, and then you can compare each day at the same time of day how the changes are taking place. And that's a very powerful tool for a geotechnical engineer, number one, just so that you understand how things are changing. But not only that, it also gives you the ability to then uh, convey that message to the people that are making the decisions, uh, the management on the mine or, or on the engineering project that you're working on and actually make them make the right decision. Uh, a good example of that, uh, we assisted with a, a dam that was failing um, uh, two years ago in the Derbyshire Dales. 
um, there was a, a large reservoir that had um, been damaged by flood water and the dam was starting to move. And I was then able to step in and provide sections um, every day and give that to the project engineer. And that allowed him to be able to see what movement was taking place and um, how to then react to that movement, etc., and and what needed to be done. In addition to that, you'll see on the right hand side that you've got uh, what we call a scan surface, which is basically a picture quality surface that can be generated from dense enough scan data, which can then be used um, as a, a mapping, um, you know, or geological preservation tool. So you can then use that high quality image um, in order to preserve the geology and as things change, you can then go back and reference those surfaces um, almost like core, a digital core in order to, um, to make, uh, you know, decisions going forward. Right, so in, um, ultimately at the end of the day, the key objectives were met out of the study um, and they were able to warn, so it, it works. Um, the Sentry system was able to provide critical warnings, which is important. So there wasn't a massive delay in, um, in the time that was required in order to allow the failure to take place. So from a production point of view, they were able to shut it down, allow the failure to take place and continue. Um, they were able to do reasonably or fairly accurate um, alarming using the inverse velocity and it was easy to use and I think that's really important. The other thing I'm going to talk about today a little bit is what we call itinerant monitoring and this is um, this is something that's sort of come out. The problem is is that in the industry um, geotechnical tools are expensive. They're um, cost a lot of money to buy and put on site and it's it's difficult to get senior management. Um, I would call them, um, in English we refer to it as a grudge purchase, so something you have to buy but you don't really want to spend your money on. Um, and ultimately at the end of the day they're important for the geotechnical engineers so they've got to try and manage or balance their budget but still be able to provide senior management with the right information. So if we take a look at a classic um, sort of mining stroke uh, slope stability, you may have a, a, a LIDAR or radar on site that is being used to monitor one side of, of an open pit. The problem is, so what's happening to those areas that fall into the shadow? Are they not being monitored or are you using a different type of system? Alternatively as well, you've also got the other side of the pit, which is potentially where the, the actual system is sitting that's not being monitored as well. So at the end of the day, a large percentage of the pit is not being monitored uh, by using um, a system. And that's not unique to, to radar uh, or it's LIDAR as well. So it's critical that you're able to go out and do checks regularly on these other areas. So, if you're busy, uh, you've got those areas that are busy being missed out, how do you then tackle that uh, problem that you have? In addition to that, you also have things like tailings facilities, etc., that are on site that need monitoring. So, if we take a look at the traditional ways of doing that, you could use drone surveys. Um, you can use a traditional method, walk down into the pit and uh, with your rock hammer and your compass and you can go and look at the rocks. Uh, you can use a surveyor, um, you can use prisms, you can use uh, uh, sort of uh, measurement tools like physometers and extensiometers. All of those things are very important tools to have at your disposal. All of them have a variety of different risks that are available um, to them. So it's important that you're able to monitor and monitor safely. So let's look at a different scenario. One is, is that you have, for example, radar on site and it's busy monitoring an area in the pit. And you could potentially put your active monitoring LIDAR at another place in the pit and monitor um, a, a large area in the background, making 
or try allowing you to cover the entire pit area. And we've got a very, very good example of that in Spain that's currently happening where the two systems run um, right next to each other. We have a, a radar and a LIDAR and the radar covers the active mining area um, and the LIDAR covers another the other 92 hectares of uh, mine site. But what that does is it gives um, the geotechnical engineers uh, and a, a feeling of um, sort of safety in that if one of the system fails there's redundancy. In addition to that it also it can be used as a confirmation tool. So if you're starting to see some change, are you seeing it on both systems or you're only seeing it on the one system? And it just gives them that. But the other thing that you can do is then what we call itinerant monitoring. So you use a, a very simple survey beacon that's put up on, 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 on your site and those can be made out of concrete. Um, and they just put a, a survey bolt at the top, 5 8 bolt. And using the Sentry system, you're then able to monitor in that area and then potentially monitor other areas. And that monitoring can happen once a week, uh, once a day, once a week, or once a month, depending on the risk that's associated with that area. So you may say, okay, well, how's that um, actually continuous monitoring? Well, you using fixed um, time frame, and that is then brought into an application called Sentry Office. So it uses the same interface, you get the same data out, but you're just not using the same frequency of data collection. Again, uh, survey pillars can be put up in front of your tailings facility and you can then go and take a scan maybe once a week or every day in front of your, ta in front of your tailings facility to make sure that that is being monitored effectively. Okay, and as you can see, um, here's a, an example. So this is Sentry Office. So the scan is then brought back to the office. Um, once it's been taken, it's imported in and you're then able to get the same look and feel. So you still get the same scene, excuse me, um, with the, the heat map on it. And you're able to then extrapolate using the zones, the graphs, etc., out to get your displacement velocity um, and inverse velocity. But in addition to that, because you've got those scans being brought in, you're then able to extrapolate um, other data out of that, for example, faults or joints. So that brings me to the next bit, which is what else can you get out? So this is an example of mapping. So um, just using the scans that you're already collecting, um, you're able to produce a scan surface, which as I explained to you is a very highly, a high some picture quality uh, surface. Um, so here's an example of it being uh, blown up or zoomed in. Um, and as you can see from the middle of the picture, I've actually used um, the, the software to actually just outline a fault zone. So that's quite important because you can then use that to then go map areas, um, faults or joints, etc., and then create a surface, which you can then use um, to model that actual structure. And there's a, just an example of the, the sort of quality of how um, good the, the scans actually produce a scan surface. In addition to that, you can pick up joint sets. So you can just select um, a surface where you've got a joint um, and you're then able to then extrapolate or um, extract the joints that correlate uh, with that joint set. Rather than you having to go out into the field and take hundreds and hundreds of uh, measurements every single time, you're then able to uh, run the computer, the software is able to um, use an algorithm to then extract those uh, joint sets um, with intolerances that you've set up. And obviously that then gives you the opportunity to then create a stereo net uh, with whatever information that you need to extract. So these tools are available um, to use the same data that you're already collecting in your actual active monitoring scenario. 
The other thing I want to touch on a little bit today is a thing called design conformance, which is, is quite important. And that's just looking at um, how well, and this is often a problem, is that people don't look at what, you know, the engineers have come in and specified how things need to be laid out and nobody then checks to make sure that it's actually meeting those criteria after the fact. Um, so design conformance comes in a variety of different ways. So that's comparing what your actual is against and using a heat map, um, using sections, um, uh, looking at catch bench widths, etc., cetera, um, and whether they are clear um, in a mining environment, that's very important, but also in a road building environment. And then also looking at things like rock bolts um, and whether they've been correctly spaced, etc. cetera. Um, LIDAR also gives you the opportunity to do in-field conformance monitoring. So rather than um, somebody having to go and collect the data, come back to the office, produce the heat map, and then go back and just have a discussion, it can be done on the tablet um, using the surfaces, and then you can have a discussion already in the field with your production crews, making sure that they are meeting the correct specifications that are being laid out. So everything, for example, in this case that's red is outside of design conformance and it needs to be uh, remedied. And as I said, you know, being able to um, isolate and uh, look at rock bolts um, and look at how those rock bolts are spaced is very, very important um, to make sure that it meets the design conformance. Because ultimately at the end of the day, the, the engineers asking rock bolts to be spaced at a meter and a half spacing, but who goes and checks to make sure that they're actually in the correct space. And LIDAR is a very powerful tool for doing that because as you can see from this image, uh, it's got, the rock bolts have got really good reflectivity and you can clearly see them in your, uh, in your scans. I think at the end, just looking at um, a cost versus risk um, scenario, you've got to, bear in mind as a geotechnical engineer going forward that you've got to weigh up how much money you're going to spend in your budget versus how much risk that. So obviously manual observations have got a very low cost. You can walk around the pit, it's only your expense. But ultimately at the end of the day, there's a big risk to you as the practitioner as well as you potentially missing stuff because of being such. And as we start to move up the pyramid, you get to the really expensive stuff at the top. But where LIDAR falls in nicely is that it actually reduces, it's a much more cost effective solution, but actually reduces your risk astronomically because of what you can extract. So as I said, the additional functionality gives the user more data and in the geotechnical domain, which makes to make good decisions. Right, just in conclusion, I'd like to thank Jose for the opportunity to present. Um, this has been really good. Um, I think it's important to be in my LIDAR should be seen as a necessary addition to the arsenal of tools available to the geotechnical engineer. It's because it's good bang for bucks and it's a, basically the multi-tool. It's your Swiss army knife in the, uh, or leather man in the geotechnical world. Um, and it should not be a radar versus LIDAR struggle. There should be a collaborative approach um, and you protect the people on the ground making the decisions and make sure that they're not um, held liable. Um, and then just to final, MapTech, I'm um, always open to discussing future research in, in a formal setting um, in the use of software and equipment. So if anybody wants to get hold of me, please feel free to contact me afterwards. Right, thank you very much. Any questions?